Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my dear brothers, sisters, friends and the foes out there and welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers Podcast with your host Didi Hussein. Before I introduce today's guest I want to remind all the avid podcast listeners that you can find this episode and all three seasons on all the major audio platforms and if you're tuning in via YouTube don't be cheeky remember to click subscribe. Today's guest is joining us from Birmingham by profession he is a criminal defense lawyer but of late, he has become somewhat of a maverick politician, running for the mayoral race in West Midlands, coming third with a huge vote, vote count. And that's none other than Brother Ahmed Yaqub. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for the introduction, my brother. And thank you very much for having me. I'm long time coming. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was, it was long overdue. And I, was, I even said it before we started filming that you came to the Bedford Gaza event. And it was manic. It's manic and we briefly gave salams to each other and i was saying to that on that night i was head of security head of hospitality head of everything and i was trying to manage everything we had people that maybe had some other agendas that would have attended the event but i didn't couldn't give you that time but here we are alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah no everything happens for a reason and everything happens the way allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it to happen so alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. allah subhanahu wa ta'ala probably wanted us to have a proper conversation absolutely. a few months later in it absolutely and i've done events before so i know how manic it gets uh, mm. when you're at events and at that time i got a phone call i had to leave anyway halfway through the event mm. anyway i didn't stay all the way through i had to leave i think after the third speaker yeah. I, had to get up. I, got, I had a phone call and i had to leave How's it been? How's the transition been? Well, it's not even a transition because you're still a lawyer. Uh, but how's the kind of move to politics been? See, you know, when I met you back in November at that event, I was still in two minds as to what I'm going to do uh, about this Gaza situation, how I can make my contribution. We can't make change. Collect collectively, we can. But what I say to people is make your contribution. You have to do something about it as Muslims, as humans. So that time I was on my journey and I was thinking about what I'm going to do. So I was uh, attending loads of events all over the country, uh, speaking on some, just uh, part of the audience on some and trying to work out what is going on, first of all. What the sentiments of the community is. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And what can I do for uh, as a contribution? So that was one of the events that I uh, started with and I liked, to be fair. What did you take from that event? Because that Bedford event was a fire event. It was ramp-packed. It was, uh, I think, uh, Loki uh, was there and uh, he spoke. But what I took from there was Hamza. Dorses. Yes, he was speaking and he spoke about how bad the mainstream media is right now. That was in November mm. and how bad it's going to get yet. And it's happening. We witnessed that. So we're witnessing it. If you're pro-Palestine, you're going to be suppressed automatically. Most of the pro-Palestinian accounts on Instagram have been shadow banned myself as well. My reach has almost halved. And let's be honest, you know, there's a defense for every offense was how you blew up, right? <laughs> Before everything, Ahmed Yaqub blew up on TikTok and on Instagram from your reels, right? Yeah. Let's talk a bit about that. We'll get into Gazan politics, right? Because I want to follow, kind of follow the, the chronological transition, yeah. right? Born, born and raised in Birmingham? In Birmingham. Where's the hood? Where's the manor? Where's Aston. the lock? Aston. Okay. Um, and do you think being raised in Birmingham, you know, one of the largest cities outside of London in the UK, is the second or third largest second city? city. Sec second city of, of this country with a significant Muslim South Asian population, yeah? Has that kind of shaped your character in how you approached law, even? Yes. Because I grew up in Aston, at that time when I started studying, everyone was saying to me that don't go into criminal law. It doesn't pay well. Crime doesn't pay. That, that's what they were saying at the I've time. I've always heard that, but how true is that though? It, it depends on how good you are, how 
connected you are, how much work you have, that's what goes down to. Does it boil down to how much you bill? How much you bill and how do you bill? Okay. If you get work, don't you? Okay. So if you've got a good uh, following, you're yeah. going to make money. Depend. It uh, d- doesn't matter what area okay. of law you're in. So when I was studying, everyone was saying crime is no good. Crime is no good. When I did work experience at a firm, I realized this guy's making silly amounts of money. He has criminal defense, was he? Criminal defense. So I thought it's possible. And then I realized that if you have a network, which I did have, you will make money. So that's how the journey started. And then I worked for someone else, a criminal defense firm Mm -hmm. at the time. And I went in as a trainee solicitor. That firm was on the way out. It was closing down. Did you complete your training contract there? Yes. Okay. And when I arrived at that firm, there was about five files there, two magistrates court files and three crime court files. In the space of about a year, just over a year, 15 months, I billed for that firm £230,000. That's massive. As a trainee? As a trainee. Wow. Never happened before. I don't like to big myself up. But that's massive, bro. To build 230 as a trainee is massive. Alhamdulillah. So I don't like to big myself up, but even he realised that it's never happened before. So then I thought to myself, wow, if I can make someone else that much money, I could surely make myself that much money. Mm. So that's when the passion for criminal law started. Money, it starts with money, isn't it? Everybody wants to make money. Mm. Nobody can say that. Financial they, stability, financial incentive. Everyone and everything evolves around that because when you want to do something and you're young, what do you want to do it for? You want to make a loads of money regardless of what path you go down or what path you want to go down. Or yeah. what you'd spend that money on. Yeah. Ultimately, it's financial stability. Everybody wants it. Yeah. So when I saw that happening, and I never had a good relationship with that boss of mine, he taught me how not to treat your staff, basically. Anyway, so I moved on, and I went to work for Morris Andrew Solicitors, okay. which I own now. Mm. I went there. And Mr. Andrews, lovely gentleman, elderly guy, I said to him, I want a job. He said, I'm not looking for any employees. I said to him, look, I've just completed my training contract. I haven't learned much. I didn't learn much at that place because I was simply... How did did you build 230,000 pounds then, bro? Just, that was the amount of work that I brought in. Oh, this was just the work, the case law that you were dealing with. Yeah, that came in. That came in. Actually, practically doing the work, I didn't do much because I'll be honest with you, I was made to do other stuff, make tea, make coffee, pick kids up from school. So you weren't actually shadowing the actual, from the moment someone is instructed to where they do conflict of uh, interest checks. That way you didn't do much of that. Shadowing court cases, sitting in on interviews. You did none of that. Hardly, hardly ever. Because I had to do my police station accreditation course at Morris Andrews. Sure. I had to do basically everything there, so I didn't learn much. Okay, that's bonkers. And so I said to Morris, I want to learn. Yeah. So if you don't want to pay me, don't pay me. He was shocked because he's thinking, I've got a qualified solicitor here telling me, don't, don't pay, pay me. me. <laughs> but... That was the best decision that I made in my life. Walked into Maris and said, I want to work there for free. Because I knew I've just built almost a quarter of a million pound at this old firm. I could build the same here and he could give me a commission. So I said to him, just give me commission on whatever I bring in. He said, okay. So I started at Maris Andrews, alhamdulillah. This is what I say to my staff when they say we've it's hard, we can't do it, or we've got too much pressure on ourselves. I went into Maurice Andrews, so that was a Friday, I went to see him. He said, come in on Monday, Mr. Yacoub. I went in on Monday. He said, go to court. 
I said, okay, I've never been to court at that time. I went to court and I said, what do I have to do in court? He said, you have a trial. I said, wow, how do I do one of them? I didn't know how to do a trial. So I, went, I, went, I, I took the file, went to the magistrate's court. It was a domestic violence case. I didn't know what to do, I'll be honest with you. I met a sister there. I still chat to her till this day. I asked her, what shall I do? She told me, this is how the procedure works, do this, so you'll be okay. I went inside, I did the trial, and I won that trial. I thought to myself, wow, okay. Then I did another trial for Maurice again in Coventry Crime Court, a magistrate's court, sorry. I went there and I won that as well. So I was getting the knack of it now, thinking this is good, I know what to do. I worked for Morris from 2014 to 2016. During that time, I've had discussions with Morris now because Morris was at that time 70 plus, wanting to retire, wanting to move to Jamaica. So we was having discussions regularly about what he wants to do with the firm. And I put forward the proposition. I said, what if I take your firm off you and I pay you for life basically I'll run everything and I'll keep paying you. I'm assuming he was the sole partner. He was a sole partner. At that time, it was only a sole trader business. Sole it trader. wasn't even a company as it is now. So he said, it was, we kept going back and forth. Then he made a decision. He goes, if I give it to you, it's going to be yours. I don't want nothing from it then. And if I don't give it to you, I'm going to keep it. Bearing in mind, he had staff members at the time who've been with him for years and years. But in the end, he made the decision to sell it to me. Kid you not, my brother, alhamdulillah. First six months, we were going back and forth about the figure why he's going to sell it. That's going to be my next question. How much did you end up buying it for? It was quite a lot of money at the time, alhamdulillah. £140,000 for one portion of the business. I sat down with Maurice in my office and shook on the deal shook hands on the deal and got up from that room kid you not my brother i didn't have a single penny to my name at that time wow. so alhamdulillah i went through my phone book and started phoning people as soon as i got out of that room and i managed to raise what we agreed that i would have to give him as a initial sum to take over basically mm -hmm. So I managed to raise the Alhamdulillah within a week. So and all them people that I took loans off at the time, some were struggling at the time themselves. So them people are the people who are closest to me right now. Alhamdulillah. Understand, understand, understandably, bro. And I'm doing better than most of them now financially as well. So when Allah. them brothers or sisters need anything, they know. I'm the first person to call and I can't say no. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Bro, since we're on this whole kind of criminal defense and like we're going to get to how it went into TikTok and social media, um, I have some questions related to criminal defense and law. If you can uh, clarify or answer them. Um, Brothers and sisters and friends, I see that you're enjoying the content. How come you've not clicked subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel? And if you're watching via Rumble, how come you've not subscribed on our Rumble channel? If you like the content, you like the guests, you like what we're talking about, it's absolutely inexcusable and cheeky for you not to click subscribe. Thank you and Jazakallah khair. One's a very basic one. Are you allowed to film Vese in public? Yeah. Yeah? You're allowed to film, yeah. Can you film a police officer? Yes. Whilst he's questioning you uh, on in the public, or if you've been stopped and questioned, you can film them? Yes, a lot of people have a misconception that they can't film the police. Yep. That's because the police tell them not to do it. Yep. But that doesn't mean it's illegal. Okay. The police are probably saying not to do it because it's causing them uh, uncomfort. They're, they're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Because if you've got a camera in somebody's face and you're being disruptive, naturally, you would, I would as well say to whoever's recording don't me, film me, excuse me, say, don't do you mind, do yeah. you mind, yeah, don't film me. The truth is, the police, they can be filmed, 
as long as you don't be disrespectful and don't interfere with their investigation. Okay. So if you're interrupting their investigation, for example, if the police are arresting you or speaking to you and I keep coming up and try to film you, get in between you guys, then I'm obstructing the investigation. If I'm calmly filming from a distance and not getting in nobody's face, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not against the law. What's, um, what's the actual difference between common assault, ABH, and GBH? Common assault, Section 39 assault. There's a misconception there as well. Assault isn't always someone getting hit or impact being made. The common assault could be just putting somebody in uh, fear of being assaulted. Oh, so it doesn't even have to be a physical touch or contact? No, okay, no. wow. So common assault, battery is one of them, and then one, one is just assault, just common assault. So battery is, yes, there has to be some sort of okay. uh, connection there. But assault... What, what, what does spitting fall under? Spitting at someone? Assault, that's okay. assault. That's, I was going to come on to that, you know. Okay. It's like you read my mind. No, no, sure. I was thinking, I always wonder, what does spit wow, for? Wow, it's like you read my mind because I was going to come on to that. Look, one thing is punching someone, that'll be battery. If you just spit on someone, that'll be assault as well. But it's, you haven't to hit someone. So even if somebody is put in fear, that could amount to assault as well. And then you have GBH, ABH, which is actual bodily harm, which is a, a section 47. That is one above the 39. That is an either way offence, which means it can be tried in the magistrate's court or the crime court. The maximum sentence is five years imprisonment or four, four and a half, something like that. And it's when you actually cause damage. Mm -hmm. So with the 39 assault, if you just punch someone and there's no bruising, there's no marks, there's no grazes, that's 39. 47 would be, uh, ABH would be if the you, there's vis visible, marks, marks, marks. Okay. visible marks. GBH would be if there's broken skin and there's blood. So that's section 20. What's the highest bird you can you get, get for GBH? GBH, you could get up to 10 years. Wow. Um, you know, when you say no comment in an interview and you insist on not commenting the entire interview. Not saying something in the interview, can it actually be used against you in a court of law? It can be used against you in the court of law, but that can't be the only reason why the jury find you guilty. And they'll be told that, they'll be directed to basically not make a decision solely based on the no comment interview. Okay. But there's occasions, there's lo I've done it loads of times that the judge specifically directs the jury to not draw any inferences. That basically means to not take into account that this person said no comment in the interview. I say this quite a lot of times and my clients have said it quite a lot of times as well. If you go to the doctor now and the doctor prescribes you with medication mm -hmm. are you going to say to the doctor if you're not a doctor yourself if you're not a medical professional yourself are you going to say to the medical professional no i don't want that medicine unless you're allergic to it or something like that mm -hmm. that's that's a different story but no just, you don't you don't question you take you it. don't question isn't you, tr you trust his professions you trust the profession yep. so if you're arrested and you call a lawyer to the police station and your lawyer says i want you to say no comment are you going to question that lawyer now? No, You're you take not, his advice, isn't you it? You take his advice, isn't yeah. it? So a lot of my clients have said that and the jury can't say otherwise or think otherwise. If someone's sitting there and saying, listen, my lawyer came to the police station and made me say no comment, not made me, advised me to say no comment and I, I took on board his advice and I said no comment, what have I done wrong? Two more questions. Um, you always see in American movies and in the States at least that if you're if you've been arrested for something, you've been remanded, or or our the American equivalent of being remanded, they're keeping you in 
and a family member or a partner may come across and put bail down, you know? Um, does the UK legal system have a similar system? Do, can, can family members put bail down to get someone released? Yes. High works. And why do we not hear about it often like we do with the American movies? In America, I don't the court cases are they give a lot of publicity. They're not here for yeah, some they're very televised. It's, it's it's an entertainment thing actually. It is, isn't it? It's a very American Yeah, it's not. Yeah. I think uh, again I don't want to big myself up, but I think I'm the lawyer who's bought law. Yeah, I think I I I, I, I was gonna say that you you're you're a bit American in your style because because you, you see that American lawyers they're very flamboyant, very outspoken, very kind of, you know, a bit of, a bit of characters, Bandai characters. You've got to have some character. Yeah, yeah. That's where it came from. My idea came, I'm going to come on to that, that my idea from the social media t- thing came from. Yeah. Uh, and that's whether it's criminal defence, whether it's conveyancing, whether mm-hmm. it's real estate, they all have a, a character to them. The, the, and, ad, and advertising is huge there. The real deal they are, yeah. the marketing is here. We wasn't allowed to um, advertise. Yes. Because there's strict SRA like regulations yes, pertaining to how you advertise your law. about 30 years ago, it changed or something like that. Bro, well, I know because, believe it or not, I was a director of a law firm once. Oh, was it? Yeah. A business director, though. Okay. Yeah, so I was a business director of a law firm for two years. Uh, Dear Valente Solicitors in Bedford, mashallah. Okay, uh, top, mashallah. top law firm. Um, big up to Mr. Kamar Rahman. And... Um, I remember when it came to putting marketing and adverts together, there were very strict regulations about what you can and can't do, what you can and cannot claim. You know, even like there's one brother, a very good friend of mine, Sajid Shaban. Uh, he has Shaban solicitors in Stoke. I remember when I was putting his criminal defence advert together, he was like, bro, you can't have this in there because it implies this and you can't have uh, a, a, a car accident. Or there's, just, there's certain things you can't depict for TV, for Ofcom, for broadcast, for print. And I was like, subhanAllah, I didn't know this, man. This is like, so I was kind of learning on the job. Uh, whereas in America, bro, it's like literally watching a Hollywood advert with, with lawyers. It's funny, in it, sometimes it's like they say to you, yeah, go and do something and I'll get you off. Yeah, in basically. Other, in other words, <laughs> yeah. there's an ad. Um, i seen it on Instagram. Somebody sent me the thing. It said it. Uh, and they rip competitors as well, which, yeah. is, which is not a very British thing to do. The, 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 the Americans do it. It's hilarious. Well, I like them. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's hilarious. It's entertaining, bro. Yeah. And it gets you the jobs. It gets you the referrals. Well, lawyer, what did they say? Um, just because you did it, it doesn't mean you're guilty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my God. No, I made a video about that as well because <laughs> you could use that in UK uh, context as well. Yeah. That is, is simple. Yeah. Just because you did it, it doesn't mean you're guilty. Mm-hmm. There's two elements. In order for you to be found guilty of a criminal offence for most cases, because some are strict liability offences, I'm going to come on to that as well. For most cases, there's two elements. Mens rea, which is the mental element, what were you thinking at the time of the offence, and actors reas, which is the actual action yep. taking place. So if your intention, for example, wasn't to kill someone, and for example, you have a fight with me, we have a fight, you pull a, out a knife, you try to stab me, you get stabbed in the process and you die. I can easily get charged with murder, but my intention was simply to get the knife off you and fight you off. But in, in the process, you died. In the process, you have got stabbed yep. and you die. My intention was simply self-defense, but the offense took place, you've been killed, you've been murdered. Yep. If both of those elements are not satisfied, you're going to be found not guilty at the trial. So a lot of American lawyers, they do it. There's two lawyers, America, American lawyers, they're called Pop Brothers at Law. I don't know if you've seen them. No. Somebody sent me their video a couple of years ago, and I liked it. They, they swear quite a lot. There's no regu- it's like they're not regulated. Again, it's, 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 it's an American thing, it's wild. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's like Hollywood ads. When, when, you see law, when you see lawyers do adverts in America, sometimes I watch them like, is this for real? And then I realize it is a country of Fox News, so that's why it, yeah, it exactly. makes sense. It makes they sense. swear and everything, so yeah. they were swearing, shut the F up, shut the yeah. F up, this, that. I changed it as Obviously. no comment. <laughs> so, Bail. Oh, sorry, Bell was asking about Bell. Do you yeah. put, can Brits put Surety bells? and security, you can put that down. Mm. I, it doesn't have a huge impact on the decision, though. Uh, I don't know how 
much it impacts the judge's decision in the in, America. in the in the in America. But here, I don't think it impacts the decision based on the amount of money that a family member is putting down. So how it works is security is one uh, thing where you put money into the court's bank account. So, for example, if my family member was arrested for a massive offence of, I don't know, drug dealing or whatever offence it was, I would put down money and that money would go directly into the court's bank account and I would be told if that person doesn't attend court mm -hmm. for the proceedings, then that money could be taken away from you, which happens quite a lot. But a lot of people, what they put down is surety or security. Surety is uh, a building property. So you would say, I'm putting down this property with a million pounds, for example. Mm. And if so-and-so doesn't come to court, then they could end up losing that property. Because the whole idea is that they put that surety down to get that person out of remand? I'm out saying. of remand. Yeah, yeah out of remand. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of people, when they are in prison and they know the evidence is overwhelming against them, they kind of like, you try to get used to it nowadays yeah. and say, leave me here. Made my bed kind of thing. Yeah. Um, self-defense. You know, what is the remit of self-defense within reasonable grounds? Meaning, so I'll give you two contexts. Um, something kicks off on road. Someone started, someone's initiated, uh, uh, you know, an encounter. It's going to get physical. They've maybe thrown the first punch. You've battered them or you've sparked them out. At what point can the person defending themselves end up being arrested and in trouble? It's called excessive self-defense. So if you come up to me and you square up to me and say, I'm going to do this to you, I'm going to do this to you, I'm going to do this to you. Up in your face. Up, up in my face. I don't have to wait till you hit me. Okay. If I feel, if I'm being put in, in fear of yeah. violence being used against me, mm -hmm. I'll strike you first. Okay. So it's not necessarily a case. So, so self-defense can be you initiating the first strike. Yeah, you can okay. hit someone first. If you feel genuinely threatened and, and you have to defend yourself before you get sparked. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've used self-defense well, or defense of um, uh, one of my clients got caught with a knife and we use self-defense. And one of my colleagues was saying it's not going to work because uh, it's meant to be the danger is... The offensive weapon in a public space. That and the danger is meant to be imminent and this danger is not imminent. But we demonstrated that our client was in so much fear that every time he leaves the house, he feels that he's going to get assaulted. He's been shot at before, he's been kidnapped and all of that. We brought all that into court. That client got found not guilty. Even I was surprised. Wow. So he got caught with a knife. With a knife. Outside of his home, outside right? Of which, which, is, which is possession of an offensive weapon in a public space, yeah. right? And because of the madness he was already involved in, he got away with having that self self defense. Self defense. Now you've got found not guilty uh, at a at Birmingham Crown Court after a trial. Wow. And we elected Crown Court trial in that case. So some cases they are either way offences. So they're either tried in the magistrate court or the Crown Court. In that case, we elected. So if the court say yes, it's okay, it can be tried within this jurisdiction in the magistrate's court, clients still have an option. Mm -hmm. And in that case, we opted for Crown Court trial. And uh, got found not guilty. Last question. How does legal aid work? And who is eligible for legal aid? Everyone is eligible for legal aid when it comes to the police station. So if you're arrested in Bedford, for example, and you call Morris Andrews Solicitors, product placement, <laughs> <laughs> you call Morris Andrews Solicitors, it will be free of charge for the police station stage. And again, if your case goes to the Crown Court, 
everyone is entitled to legal aid, but based on your income, you may have to make a contribution to the legal aid agency. I think it's about £30,000 and above in the Crown Court, and in the Magistrates Court, it's about £16,000 and above. So if you're earning more than that? If you're earning more than that, then you have to make a contribution. But sometimes the contribution is so high that the clients prefer paying privately. The thing with legal aid, everyone thinks it's free. If you own a property and you have capital in that property, I think it's of more than £40,000, then you will automatically have to make a contribution. Even if you don't make a contribution during your proceedings, they have softwares and systems in place now that after your proceedings, if you are found guilty, then the system picks it up that he owns a property. Ahmad is Yacoub owns a property. Worth this much. Worth this much. So his lawyers have been paid this much from the legal aid agency. They shouldn't have get the money back off him. So I've got so much people that have come out of prison after being convicted and now they've got a hefty Oof. legal aid bill. That's crazy. It's crazy. And there's nothing we can do about it at all. Nothing. So when did this all then formulate into you becoming a freaking TikTok, Instagram, legal defense lawyer guy who's doing it for every offense, there's a defense. When, when, when did that whole idea come up? What, just the social media or that line? Both. Everything. Tell me about both. So during COVID. At what point did you realize that, now? Nah, do you know what? Social media is where it is. During COVID, and when somebody sent me that video, after this, watch that video, Pop Brothers at Law. Yeah. Uh, it's called the Shut the F Up video. Yeah. Watch it, you'll see. <laughs> it was that video. And during COVID, I saw a lot of people blowing up on social media, just clowning. Because of lockdown. Because of lockdown. And yeah. I, was, I was looking at them, what they were doing, million views, two million views, and they're not even doing much. People were bored sitting at home because they couldn't go out and they were just looking at their phones. And somebody gave me the advice. They said, if you want to do something on social media, now is the time. So I made one video. It didn't do well. The second video, it did well in terms of views. And then they just started blowing up afterwards. And then sooner or later, it became a thing. Became a thing. And Alhamdulillah. And then now there's a, a lot of other lawyers who are doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And... I'm a bit of a trendsetter anyway. No, 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 definitely, I'm definitely. Really because that's where I first saw you. I started seeing your videos on Instagram. It was coming up on my feed. And I was seeing other prominent accounts sharing them as well. And I was like, wow, this, this is... I hadn't seen that type... It, yeah, it felt American. It did it. It, 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 it just felt American. I was like, this is... Br British lawyers don't really do this. They don't. They don't, they don't really flex like this. Because, um, you know, in I don't know what I've, it is. I, I, I think what it is. British lawyers... They're a bit more gentrified. I was gonna. Come it, it seems more like a cricketer's uh, profession. A posh. Yeah, posh. Yeah, and 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 even in my, there's a very gentleman esque, uh, you know, even even like the wig and all of that. Whereas the Americans, it's it's a bit more cowboyish. It's like yeah, wild wild west. Like the Let's go. Yeah, they move like that. Like, <laughs> Kleinfeld from Carlito's way. He was as much as a gunda as Carlito was, if not yeah, a bigger gunda. You know what I mean? He's he's so um, yeah, I, I just wonder. The Lincoln lawyer. I've seen the Lincoln lawyer. Of course. There you go. What? Fantastic movie. And again, just shows the flex of American lawyers. And it's not just criminal defense. I'm talking about real estate guys as well. Everything. They, they just have this kind of aggression type marketing, which is which is which works. It works. It works, it works. That's why people in uh, UK now. They, it was. It wasn't heard of. Yeah. People going online and making videos. And then what shocked people is when I had the client sitting next to in me. In fact, um, the accident claims you should, guys, you should do a bit of that. I did it. They did a bit of that. Fucking yeah. Really where, the, where, there's a, where there's a blame, there's a claim. claim or something. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, that got rinsed. Yeah. Know, exactly. But other areas of law, no. Not criminal defense, not immigration, not conveyancing, not civil litigation, none of that. It was always in uh, accidents and insurance claims. Yeah. But, you know, when you came into the scene, I was like, right, this is it's a, it's a very American style. I wonder how it's going to work. And, and then I was thinking, right, you're going viral all the time. Alhamdulillah, it worked, man. It but did it lead to instructions, though? Yes. That's the point I'm trying to make. Yes. Did, or was it just a brand awareness kind of thing? No. Did Allah, it actually lead to Allah, formal. Alhamdulillah. A lot of cases come through social media Tick. because 
people don't know what to do in situations. A normal person will not know what to do when they are arrested. But everyone's got a phone and everyone's on social media. Mm-hmm. I was shocked. I tell you, the most shocking thing that's happened to me so far I, I, in terms of getting recognized, I was thinking, wow. I was driving home. A homeless man knocks my window, wants money, one I give him. And he says, there's a defense for every offense. <laughs> I thought, wow. So even people like that, you wouldn't think they'll have a phone or they'll have access to Instagram or TikTok. They see that stuff. So the more brand awareness there is, the more naturally, the more work. Um, another, another is related to, so there's another question I'm waiting for clarification. There's, there's rumors that you always hear, um, Never go for the duty solicitor. They're in on it with the mob. They're in it with the police. Don't go for the. Don't trust the duty solicitor. Uh, is this just a rumor? Is there is there some level of uh, See, truth to it? That's uh, it's a rumor. It's okay, a so rumor. okay. See, a duty solicitor is someone who is allocated by the legal aid agency every couple of months. So even me, I could be doing a legal duty. Mama, doing a duty officer. Yeah, I could be doing because you have one day every Sorry, couple of months. Tutorial. I think it's 12 hours, some schemes are 24 hours, so it'll be from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. the next day. And if you're arrested, you ask for the duty solicitor. And if we happen to be the duty solicitors on that day, it'd be someone from our firm, my okay. family solicitors. So it's a myth that people say uh, they work for the police. Have some you heard, you've heard it of? Loads. Some, <laughs> of, some of them, some of them uh, are probably close to the police because they work so Close much at that. that particular police station they yeah. build a relationship with the police don't they yeah, yeah, yeah. so what it doesn't mean that they're on the payroll or or they're against you or, or they're against you they're not but i must say this though a normal duty solicitor will not go out of his way for you or her way for you uh rather than he would for his own clients so he wouldn't break his back for a client that he's got off duty, but he would if it's his own personal client, client. Own personal client. That, that's, that's, that's the truth. That's actually the truth. Since October the 7th and the genocidal war that we have seen for the last seven months, 40,000 shaheed, 14,000 children, 10,000 women, these are just the official numbers. We're not even talking about those who will end up dying as a result of the injuries. We're not talking about those who are still under rubble, considering that 80 to 90% of the entirety of Gaza is inhabitable as we speak. As you were considering this kind of doing something for Gaza and doing something for the, the people of Palestine, did you encounter other Muslim lawyers that were kind of in the activist space for example, Attic Mali from Liberty Law or uh, Tasni Makanji. Have you heard some of these guys? Have you met some of these guys? Do you have a relationship with some of these guys? Yeah, I've not. I've met Atik. I consider him as a friend. Tasnim, I've met him and I chat to him on a, on a regular basis. I mentioned them because these are guys who are also lawyers. And they're, also, and, and they're kind of activists as well. Yeah. They're involved in community issues. Yeah, they are. See, Atik's a very popular guy. Uh, Atik very? is one of the first lawyers that I looked at and said, wow. 24 hours in police 24 custody. 24 hours in police custody. Yeah. So he was a bit of a celebrity lawyer. Uh, and same thing with Tasnim. He did Shamima. Hi, ha- Shamima Begum, high Shamima, profile ISIS high cases. Pro- yeah, yeah, ISIS cases. So I we tend to know each other anyway because it's a small, if you think about it, where it's feel, it's, uh, seems like a big field but it's not everyone knows each other okay and i they they're politically involved i think tasni made his announcement to stand for Beth, bethnal green yeah he's uh, looking to this from roshanara uh, yeah Ali. which i hope he does inshallah inshallah and uh, it was the gaza issue that got him into it as well but atik's been politically involved for years, for years yeah i think he stood up for the council elections in Luton, he did, election, uh, know, which was uh, years ago. Mm. And these guys are a bit older than me as well. Uh, How old are you? I'm the same age as you. 
Okay, TK, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to end up Googling when was my date of birth? It's at the end of my Twitter handle. <laughs> That's it. They're going to clock you. <laughs> so, you. So you knew Attic and Tassim, these guys, before you yeah. kind of wanted to transition into po- yeah. politics. So this uh, the transition took place in on, not on, on October 7th before I always wanted to do something. I've got a friend of mine. His mm-hmm. name is Abdul. Okay. Top brother. He Abdul. always advises me uh, as to what I should do, what I shouldn't do. Not just advises me and always uh, bigging me up, but he'll all also criticize me as well. He, when he first met me a few years ago, he said to me, brother, you are bigger than law and I want you to do something. So you leave a legacy behind. I said, wow, you know, big words. But anyway, that, he spoke to me a week or two ago after the elections. He said, do you know what I was trying, trying to say to you a couple of years ago? I go, yes, trying to make sense now. So law was law. Yes, I'm making money from it. It's good. But what am I going to do for the people who can't benefit me in any way whatsoever? That's why I wanted to do something. October the 7th came. And of course, I see in silence of our politicians up and down the country, Muslim politicians. And on the other hand, you have non-Muslim politicians who are actually supportive of the cause. Mm. I was getting fed up. I was trying to get in touch with other local politicians, MPs. No one speaking. Who is your local MP? Shabana Mahmood. Shabana Mahmood is my local MP. Currently, Currently, up until November of this year, very likely. After that, she's not going to be our MP, inshallah. Okay. It's going to be me, okay. uh, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. So on November last year, the vote took place in the House of uh, Parliament, in the House of Commons. For the ceasefire. Cease, ceasefire vote. Yeah. That shocked me and it shocked a lot of people. I have an MP, Shabana Mahmood. Rushnara Ali. Rushnara Ali was one of them as well. Tulip Sadiq. Tulip Sadiq, yeah. Uh, Saki Bati. Yep. Uh, who else is there? I don't want to misquote. There was there was five Muslim MPs that did not vote for the ceasefire. Saki. Yeah, Saki was one of them. Rushna was one of them. Tulip was one of them. Uh, Shabana was one of them. One and, of there's, and there's 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 another fifth one. It was, one, it was a Tory MP. Yeah. I think I think most if I think most Tory Muslim MPs they all voted against, for, uh, against the ceasefire. Against. So I thought to myself, how can somebody do that? How can somebody with an iota of humanity and in a public office just abstain from voting? I've got four children, alhamdulillah, I've got four boys. You know, I love them to bits. Yesterday, I was speaking to one of them and he said, oh, on weekends we don't do anything anymore. Dad's always busy. He was trying to be sarcastic to me. I said to him, I had to be a bit aggressive. I said, oh, listen to me. So you see the kids that are getting blown up in Gaza, they're your age, they're younger than you. What do they do on the weekends? All they're worried about is whether they're going to survive the day or not. Shabana Mahmood abstained. So that's when I made an announcement. I said to myself, no, if nobody else is going to do it, I feel like it's my duty to contest elections from my area and talk about this thing, whether I can change you or not, whether Israel are going to listen to me, would Israel have listened to Shabana Mahmoud? No. But at least it shows that she's listening to the people, not just the Muslim people, 85% of the general population of the UK wanted at that time a ceasefire. ceasefire. ceasefire, yeah. So I made an announcement and my brother, Alhamdulillah, you know where the intention came into my mind and my heart? It was in South Hall Central Masjid. Okay. I was there and I was thinking, what shall I do? What shall I do? So a day after, then my nephew was with me, Daniel. I said, make a video. I'm about to make an announcement. I'm going to stand up for an, as an MP against Shubhana Mahmood in the general elections. Just, just happened there and then you decided? There and then. I decided in the house of Allah and I made the announcement. And then I've not looked back 
since then. Alhamdulillah. We'll get to the upcoming general election this year where you're going to be standing against Shaban Mahmood in your own constituency, in your home constituency. But let's talk about the West Midlands mayoral race. You came third. 70,000 votes. That's a must. That's, that's a big number, bruv. Mashallah. And um, this is someone who's never ran for politics or, or an elected office before. That is a massive vote count. You know, 70,000, nearly 70. Was it 68 or 69? 69. 69,000 and then a couple of, basically 70,000 votes. That's massive. Were you, obviously, we all, your supporters, yourself, the community and those who were trying to shake the uh, grounds of the two-party political system obviously wanted you to win. But is it true that this was a trial run for November? This was... To see, to see, as in to test the waters, test the waters and see the reactions of the people, and this showed me and showed millions around the world that the people want a change. People are fed up of the mainstream political parties and the duopoly that is happening, the two-party duopoly that's happening in the United Kingdom. People are fed up, and I did this to see, to show people. Uh, one man as an independent candidate with the people's support behind them can rock and shock the political system in the United Kingdom. You had endorsements from George Galloway, um, the by-election winner of Rochdale. Um, you had celebrity endorsements from the likes of Amir Khan and others. And, you know... Again, I, I can't begin to stress and how people understand the significance of it, of an independent candidate who's never ran for an elected office before in a kind of regional mayoral race. You know, so you're not just covering Birmingham, you're covering many other towns and cities, right? Yeah, West Midlands. West Midlands, West Midlands massive. Seven, area, yeah? seven areas. Seven areas. And you came away with 70,000, whereas may, many probably would have thought, oh, he'll get maybe the Muslim votes or he'll get the votes of Birmingham. Maybe, yeah, but you, you surprised everyone. I uh, got votes, sorry, was... No, go for it, no, go. I got votes from areas that have no Muslims in there or a very small uh, percentage of Muslims in that area. Do you I think Gaza's that had that, that, that much of an impact? Even Gaza's had a huge impact on a lot of people in the West Midlands. I got votes from different demographic areas and people from all faiths. I know this because people c came up to me and a lot of people voted for me simply because I was an independent candidate. A lot of people voted for me because I was, they know me from social media. A lot of people voted for me because of the Palestine issue, but a lot of people also voted for me because of what I was saying against the political elites. A lot of people are fed up of the political elites. They know that they are taking them for a ride. They know that they are. They think that they will blindly get the votes regardless of their policies. Even Labour supporters, staunch Labour supporters, have joined my other movement. I shouldn't say my movement, other movement since the election and even some mm -hmm. before the election. Both of these parties, Tories and Labour now, Whatever policies Tories have, Labour don't even oppose them. And they like the Tory light. Light, yeah, they've yeah, been a yeah, light, like a light that. version, isn't light it? Light version. In fact, they're saying now that with the upcoming general election, Labour under Keir Starmer has pretty much won the traditional Tory voters. Hence, the Tory leadership is now appealing to who? The kind of far right, really xenophobic. The racist. The racist, like that. that, that Cut a racist. That's Hard what their opinion because they know that they kind of lost their core support middle, potentially in the middle. The, the kind of centre right, rightish, traditional conservatives. Yeah. They're now appealing to hardcore Brexiteers, you know, really hardcore nationalists and right wingers. They're going for that kind of like really dog whistle type constituency of voters, or as they like to say in political terms, the dregs, mm. right? Brothers and sisters, the Blood Brothers podcast is the largest English language Muslim podcast in the world. We've been around since 2019 and we've come a long way. With the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal and your generous help and support in engagement, in commenting, in subscribing and so forth. However, creating this content for you all doesn't come cheap. So be a part of this movement. 
be a part of growing this podcast to the next level. There will be a donation link in the description. Please click and support the Blood Brothers podcast. Um, but you got Labour voters as well. You got Labour votes as well from people who are staunch Labour. They, 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 joined, they joined us and they were campaigning for me. See, our, the South Asian community blindly vote for Labour. They've got the rose sign and even the elders, they go to the polling stations and they'll click, uh, this, they'll cast their vote, they'll tick on uh, the, the, the rose, for example. And they won't even know anything about it. This election, I actually woke people up, elders. I was knocking doors and saying to them, who are you going to vote for? Well, Labour said, why would you want to vote for Labour? They go, we've been doing it for... Since the 60s. Decades. Since our forefathers arrived here. Decades. But when our forefathers arrived here, they came here to survive. They were hungry. And Labour was for them at that time. It, it was the party that made sense because the Tories weren't taking them. For the workers in yeah. it. The workers. No blacks, no Irish, no Indians. Exactly. Or, or, and the Tories at the time were a very racist party. Yeah. They still are. The nasty party. Yeah. So Labour was for the working class people. Now, we don't have to blindly vote for Labour because we're not here just to survive. We're here to thrive. And we are not going anywhere. We're going to stay here. Me, myself, my life plan, my life goal was, my brother, after Ramadan, the, the Ramadan that is gone this year, a month ago, I wanted to go and semi-retire, live in Pakistan and spend time with my mom and dad. Are you from AJK? Yeah, Alhamdulillah. And I've got business interests there. My dad's got business interests there. So I wanted to go there and spend time with them. In Dadiyal? yeah. Dadiyal. And I wanted to live there. October 7th has changed my whole life plan. SubhanAllah. My whole life plan has changed now. So, like you mentioned earlier, I only got into politics in November last year. And Alhamdulillah, I managed to gain 70,000 votes. Six months, bro. Six months, Alhamdulillah. And there's people that have been doing this for years. And I said this to a lot of people. I said, look, who are in the Labour Party, el el I shouldn't say elderly people, people who are older than me and who've got more political experience than me, I said to them, not being cocky or big-headed or anything like that, but I've said to them, listen, now is the time to make a change. Let's break away from this Labour Party and let's form an independent movement and show these political elites that, look, we are not going to blindly vote for them. And it's not just about the Gaza issue. A lot of us, I met an elderly woman and she said to me, my issue with the government is this. They are sending billions in aid to Ukraine and Israel whilst there are homeless people in West Midlands. Austerity, rise of cost of living. Child poverty. Child poverty, f um, food banks. Record number. Record number of food banks. You know, we're seeing even like people in professional jobs, nurses, um, you know, people who have graduated from universities in, in, in jobs that you would think, teachers, now relying on food banks. Food Crazy. Bank. I volunteer at food banks and we see students, we see, like you just said, uh, graduates, teachers, teachers, and it's shocking. Credit goes to the people who organize these food banks, but in the United Kingdom, in the country of the NHS, country of the NHS, how does it work? one of the richest countries in the world, they're sending billions to Ukraine and Israel. Why well, people are starving? Well, people are starving. A lot of people have that issue. It's not about Gaza. A lot of people are saying to me, they're calling me the TikTok Gaza lawyer uh, on BBC and stuff. The thing is, <laughs> the thing is, it's not about TikTok. It's not about Gaza. It's about fix your own country up first while sticking your nose into other people's business. How is sending money to Israel going to benefit the residents of the United Kingdom or the residents of Bedford or the residents of Birmingham. How? It's not. Mm -hmm. It's just putting people off the government, putting people off the politicians, which is good for people like me, for people who have just stepped into politics. A lot of people didn't even know this, that you can stand up as an independent candidate in elections 
a lot of people didn't know. A lot of people didn't know that you can actually go and vote for the mayor. They didn't know. A lot of people were sleeping politically and alhamdulillah, through the help of Allah, I woke a lot of people up over the last couple of months. I only decided to contest this election at the end of March. I had just over four weeks to campaign and I managed to show people that look, this guy alone, not alone, alhamdulillah, the people with me, I got a lot of people with me. In yeah, a lot of support, bro. A lot yeah, of good team around you. Good team, man, and good team and a lot of people that work tire tirelessly, man, 24 hours, literally worked harder than me. On the day of the uh, election, where were you canvassing? Well, you're not kind of formally allowed to canvass canvass, but which areas were you doing the PDA in? On, uh, on, on Alam Rock. Alam Rock, of course. Small uh, Heath. Okay. Um, Aston. My own areas. Okay. And they didn't let me down, man. They came out in numbers. And we got votes from all over Birmingham. And the constituency, this is a fact, the constituency that I want to contest elections in. Oh, just can I ask you that. How many votes came from that constituency? Ladywood. 40% of the vote share, I landslided it, I won. Labour got 29% 29 of the vote share. I think uh, the total so, so, votes so, cost were about 9,000. So basically 40% 40, 40 of your 70,000 came from Ladywood? No. Came from where? So 40% of the votes casted in Ladywood, which were about 10,000. Oh, sorry, yes, okay. Yeah, uh, came, to, came to me. So I won that constituency. Not only that constituency, I won Peribar constituency. Khalid Mahmoud. Khalid Mahmoud, which is going to be contested for by a good friend of mine, Barrister Ayub Khan. Yep. He's with the Liberal Democrats, but they have asked for a ceasefire, mm. and he's going to contest that seat, and I'm going to support him wholeheartedly. And we've got our brother Shakir Lafsa. Shakir right, is going to come, that, come to that. Hall Green. Hall Green. Shakir Lafsa is going to contest there, and he's already... That's against Ta Tahir Ali. Tahir Ali. Yep. He's already won that constituency according to the mayoral elections figures. Mm. Yardley, which Jody McIntyre is going to contest, inshallah. Top brother. He's also won that according to the mayoral figures. So let's get this straight. For people who are trying to work out what we're trying to do here. You got 70,000 votes in the Westminster's mayoral race. You get to see how many of those votes from which areas they came from. Wicked. And from there, you can kind of tell that if you've done Labour there, then it's looking good for the general election. Yes. Because if you've done Labour for the West Midlands mayoral election, you should, inshallah, them, in inshallah. theory, do them in the general election. And we know where, where, where we need to work on. Okay. Where we, some seats were marginal, for example, Hodge Hill, Liam Bernsey, that was okay. marginal. Um, I think. Um, what about Solihull? They took 30 something, we took 30 something. Uh, Solihull. I received a lot of votes from Salihul, but Tories took the seat. Okay. Edinton was marginal. So some seats we know are marginal and some we know we are strong. Warsaw West, we took 8,000 votes from wow. there. Another 1,000 votes and we won, the, we won, that, yeah. won that constituency. Sandoval, uh, we took 7,500 votes from there, another 2,000 votes. We won that constituency. So really all eyes on Birmingham for this general election. From, from, from a kind of Muslim <laughs> pro-Palestine perspective, from a Muslim pro-Palestine perspective, a lot's going to be happening in Birmingham. We can potentially take six seats yeah. from Birmingham alone. And uh, Warsaw won seven, that's seven seats. We could take Sandwell eight. But eight, eight, potentially 10 seats mm. from West Midlands, we can take. If George takes some from have you spoken to george about not putting up uh workers party candidates in those areas yes okay. uh, we've got a official meeting between the residents and other contestants on the 22nd of this month where it's called a no contest meeting where we're going to basically agree that there are not going to be more than one independent candidate in each constituency and with george uh, me and him have a regular he's a legend in politics mm. And although we may not agree with ev all of George's policies, and I don't think everyone does, anyone does agrees, agree with all of his policies, but he's someone that is against the status quo and is anti-establishment. Mm. So that we have in common. So we've spoken about not putting up candidates in certain areas. and there's an Because agreement. that would be an own goal. Like for, like, for, like, like for example. They'll get in? Yeah. 
they'll get in. Now, for example, I mean, uh, George came out, the Workers' Party came out saying that, you know, they won't be putting up a candidate um, in Ilford North of, against Leanne Mohammed. Yeah. Now, they know if they did, that'd be a big problem, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, she has a very strong chance of being West Street. You put in another candidate, that splits the vote. It splits the vote. Yeah. But what about Labour sometimes does this? They'll start putting in Andrew their own candidates just to mash up that vote. It could be from a particular brothery, it could be from a particular group, and they use that to split the vote. It's happened in my hometown of Bedford, it happens in Luton, and I'm, it most certainly happens in Midlands in the north. Did you face any of that during the mayoral race? See, the mayoral race was good uh, because they didn't see me coming. Yeah. Nobody saw me coming. They didn't have time to groom someone, they did they? They didn't have time. Uh, I spoke about it briefly on some interview. Uh, at that time, I was in two minds, and then boom, submitted my paperwork. Fourth of April, I started campaigning. They didn't see me come. They didn't see me coming. But they can't do this in the general election. General election, most likely they will. Okay. Most likely they will. But when they do, that person will get discredited because they deserve to, because they have only been put there for a specific as a lackey. Yeah, for specific purpose, and uh, they will get discredited by myself first of all, and I don't think they want that in mm. Birmingham, in West Midlands, and it doesn't matter what Biradri it is from Birmingham, if I go and speak to them, because Alhamdulillah, bro, I've got a lot of love in Birmingham from people because I grew up there, and to be fair, if anybody needs me to do something for anywhere in the country anywhere in the world if somebody w if i can help anybody i will help them but you were talking about paying for the cemetery uh renovations and fixing it up and maintenance from your own pocket yeah alhamdulillah you said you said if the local uh, government won't, i mean if the local authorities won't do it and the mayor and the mayor won't do anything about it, i'll pay for it in my own pocket would you have actually done that yeah of course man i'll still do it you know alhamdulillah bro alhamdulillah allah ta'ala gives you stuff uh, makes you financially stable in order for you to do these kind of things in it. Subhanallah. But also, it's a reflection of a sh in the failure of local government in not getting those things done in the first place. Look, uh, Birmingham is a bankrupt council. I yep. don't know about uh, Bedford. I don't no, know. No, but Birmingham is a bankrupt. Birmingham council. is a bankrupt council. The second city in the UK is bankrupt. Come Rental. on, that's a, that's a joke. And then they have so much money to spend on project. I don't know if you know the demographics of Birmingham. But I do. They have so much money to spend on. Uh, projects like the Athletes Village in Peribar. Yes. They made Peribar and Birmingham the laughing stock of the world. Athletes Village was made to accommodate athletes and their team members. No one has used one single apartment till this day. It's been a couple of years now since the Commonwealth Games. What a waste of money. They could be used and the council could benefit from council tax, first of all. Second, can, gen can generate jobs. Can generate jobs as well. Second of all, I don't know if you know this. In Birmingham, there's over ten thousand derelict council-owned properties. Why are they derelict? Why can't they be put to use? Again, they'll generate jobs. They'll generate council tax. Third, third fact. Where did all the homeless people go during COVID? They were accommodated. As soon as COVID comes to an end, kick them out, kick them out again, evicted them again. That's like playing with people's lives. If these people can do these, do this to their own people, why do we expect them to speak about foreign issues and speak about things that are happening in Gaza? Why are they going to care about a child in Gaza when they don't can't care about their child here? Kids are going to school hungry. During COVID, Marcus Ratchford gave millions yeah. for free school meals to feed uh, feed the children. And that wasn't his job. That that's not his responsibility. I was just going to come in the same way. It's not your responsibility. With with, with all due respect, with your generosity, it's not on you to be paying out of your pocket to you know maintain a cemetery or a burial site. Yeah, that this is the responsibility of the government or fix potholes. Yeah. So. I don't want to um, act like the Mother Teresa of politics, but people have to have a heart. These politicians don't have no hearts, brother. It's like they've lost touch with humanity. They're not humans no more. And uh, someone, a politician, a Muslim Labour politician, MP, got questioned about Gaza during Ramadan, or what's your issue, what's your thoughts on Gaza? 
And he pointed at the guy and he said, you shut up mm. in the broken English. Yeah. So uh, they've completely lost touch. And if you can't question them about certain things now because they'll just get angry and aggressive towards you. So, uh, oh, well, that's changing now. They're going to have to start answering questions. They have to, or otherwise they're going, they're going to, to lose the seats. That's it. The only way to damage these politicians is to make them lose their seats. And I think I woke a lot of people up now that can see it happening that these seats are winnable. If the public is with you, if you have the same agenda as the public, if you're going to listen to the public and you convince the public that you will be a voice for them, then you'll get the votes and you can unseat these politicians, these career politicians, these Zionist politicians. Bringing the podcast to somewhat of a close, um, there's two issues I wanted to raise with you. Um, there's, there's, there's some that have accused you of uh, using Gaza for a political grift, meaning... And by the way, this is not only something that's been levied at yourself. Many people across many sectors, across many professions, influencers, activists, do art, so many people, Muslims, non-Muslims, many have been accused that, look, you're seeing that a genocide is taking place. You're seeing that the conversation of genocide in Gaza is trending. You're seeing that everyone's talking about it. You've jumped onto the bandwagon to amp further amplify um, your own kind of self-interest. For example, let me, so let me just pose it to you. But Ahmed Yacoub was all doing his TikTok sketches and you know, where there's an offense, there's a defense, you know, he's already a, a social media. And the thing about social media people, influencers, we're already associated with people who want attention. Whether you're religious or irreligious, Muslim or non-Muslim, yeah. if you're on social media and you have somewhat of a following or a brand, already it is assumed that you're someone who likes attention. Someone who likes to be in the center of attention with the limelight. Some have accused you of using Gaza to basically, as an opportunity to start your political career. Is there truth to that? No, because I had no intention of entering politics in the UK before October 7th at all. Like I said earlier, my intentions were to semi-retire and live most of my time in Pakistan, in the Diyal, in Azad Kashmir, with my parents. This situation has made me change my whole life goals. So I didn't have no... If I was a politician and then jumped on to the Gaza issue, that would have been different. I'm not a politician. I only stepped into politics to challenge head-on other politicians and put them under pressure to make them realize that, wow, there are people out there that can make us lose our seats. So that allegation is totally false. And shame on the people who say that because it's unfair for you to criticize. You rather support people like me and get us to a position so we can become your voices. If more people supported me during my mayoral campaign and my mayoral race, I could have probably been the mayor of West Midlands. Certainly, there wouldn't have been a Labour mayor in the West Midlands if more mm -hmm. people supported and criticised. Mm -hmm. And Sheikh Israr said this, to be fair, after the election, he said, look, if more people supported him than criticising him, he probably would have been the mayor now or definitely would have, we wouldn't have a, a Labour mayor. So, yeah, the reason I got into politics was for Gaza. So I am going to mention Gaza when I'm campaigning. It's only right if I wasn't mentioning Gaza, then it looked like I look like a normal politician. But you've not used Gaza to further propel this social media following of yours. No, Alhamdulillah, I've had a social media following before Gaza. I mean, I've had hundreds and thousands of followers before October 7th. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people with a lot more following than me, than you as well, that don't speak about Gaza. I think those are the people that should be targeted, not people who are Optical using that. their platforms to talk about Gaza. I've been banned twice now since the Gaza, and I managed to get my accounts back, alhamdulillah, on TikTok and Instagram. So I'm, I'm putting my social media platform on the line here. You know how easy it is to yeah, get absolutely. banned. That brother in... Um, America, um, uh, the the recently convert brother. Yes, what's his name? King. 
Sean King. Sean King. Sean King. He got his account banned. He had 5 million followers. Now, you can't say to a person like that, oh, you were using Gaza for your own own uh, platform to raise your own platform. No, he's lost his platform because of that. And I'm at the risk of doing that. You're at the risk of doing that mm -hmm. as well, losing your platforms. So I think the people who are supporting Gaza and are making noise about Gaza should be supported and um, should be spoke about in the light that yes they they are doing good stuff rather than people saying they're using gaza to raise their own profile that's not the case final question and i guess this has been the most recent most topical most controversial uh event since the west Midlands mayor election that was a video a video which you featured in uh, where you, whereby you said something along the lines of correct me labor is finished you make your what is it you make your you make a decision you, or you 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 basically left it to the viewers yeah i left right? it to, what i said was this uh sorry just before you answer the question what i said was what this, was the line that you the line was this i have no words to that's it describe this you make your own judgment that's it and then there was a video that was played of two Labour uh, campaigners that were doing door to door, um, and there was an audio which, at the time of releasing the video that you featured in, it sounded quite clearly at the time, and with the text that accompanied it, said "effing Packy," right? Video went viral. I showed it. Um, loads of big prominent accounts were sharing it. It received. If you were to accumulate all the different accounts across all the different platforms, millions. Yeah. It then surfaced that it had been docked, doctored, that it was, that's not what she said. Um, and in addition to that, you also, or your account mentioned the person who it was to have said that. It was a female teacher from Birmingham. Tell me first and foremost, bro, how did that, how, when did you first come in possession of that video that video was sent in one of the campaign groups okay and got into the hands of my media team they told me about it and said this is what the video says and of course at that time i was outraged because i genuinely thought that that woman was saying fucking paki mm -hmm. i thought to myself wow that can't be happening. So I uploaded that video. Mm -hmm. And on the TikTok, on TikTok, in the comments, a lot of people were commenting who that woman was, the teacher, and commented what school she works at. So based on that, my media team took the details and put it on to X because a lot of people were asking the question about what she said or what she didn't say. Is she a racist or isn't she a racist? So the purpose of the name and the place of work was ask her yourself. When I realized that... So, so just to be clear, when her name and where she works was posted on X from your account, whether it was when Loki posted it or whether I posted it or those, or, or I think it was another independent uh, Twitter anti-labor group that was shared it as well. Newham Independent. Newham Independent. They, I think they got the most views. They got the most views. And your account commented the name and school. Are you saying that was not you? That wasn't me. That was my media team. And they got that information from the TikTok comments. So the information was already public because of the comments on my TikTok, original TikTok. Mm -hmm. So the information was already public. They got it from the TikTok comments and put posted it on X. Posted on X, commented on New Home Independence. Should that have been done? Mm, no. But the simple explanation to that, everyone was asking whether she was racist or whether she wasn't racist. 
So that was posted by my media team with the intentions of the viewers could ask her if they feel uh, she's racist or not. They could ask her directly or ask her workplace. What about authenticating the actual audio itself? For example, you know, we are living at a time of AI. We already know things can be doctored very easily. We've moved on from the Photoshop era. We're now literally living in the AI era where you can take Crazy. where you can take someone's picture and plaster it onto a pornographic image or video and you'd think it's the real thing. Uh, audios doctored, you know. Uh, did you not? I, I don't know. I, I guess one of the criticisms against you that I've saw online is that it's quite ironic that a criminal defense lawyer didn't authenticate the audio or didn't ask us questions, and you'd think that would be normal for a lawyer to do. I mean, did, did at any point did you did, uh, look? I know in the video you said you make the judgment. I know that you, you did not say she said that you did not say that this is what i believe i heard you just you left it to the viewer but the subtitles didn't help that because that assertion was already made at what point how did you feel when you realized that it was the doctor audio when i realized that it may be doctored i first of all deleted the video from my platforms and also, I messaged others. Like, there's some big meme pages on Instagram that started posting it. I specifically DM'd them and said, take it off. It may be a fake video. So I felt remorseful for sharing a video that may be doctored. But I also felt like a victim as should that poor teacher i felt like a victim also because i thought to myself wow somebody's doctored this video sent it so it gets into the hands of my media team and they know we are anti-labor and we're going to post it so if that video was doctored i think you took the bait I was the victim as well as uh, that poor teacher. Birmingham Mail was on your case, bruv. Birmingham Mail was on my case hard and they're still on my case. But the thing is this, I am not obliged to respond to the Birmingham Mail or to any media outlets. To be fair, Birmingham Mail were very anti-me. Throughout the whole mayoral race? Throughout the whole mayoral race. That's why I didn't really give them time. I've spoken to the BBC about the video. I've spoken to ITV about the video. I'm speaking to you about the video. I didn't speak to them. <laughs> I didn't speak to them about the video. Because they were very anti me all throughout the race. They kept, kept calling me the TikTok Gaza lawyer. Do you not like that name? What's the TikTok Gaza lawyer? <laughs> you got a massive following in TikTok. One of the main reasons for why you're running for campaign is Gaza. And I'm a lawyer. And you're a lawyer. Yeah, I mean, if you look maybe, at it. But I know what you mean. It, it, it's the way they projected you. As, the, as an unserious candidate because a yeah, TikTok lawyer. Yeah, exactly. That's what it the, is. What they were trying to say is that this guy is just... Uh, the TikTok, uh, he's a TikToker. That happens to be a lawyer that's campaigning back for Gaza. So yeah. I get it. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, Nico stood for... London Mayor. London Mayor. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I was laughing and joking at his campaign. People are trying to come compare his campaign to my campaign incomparable it was totally different he actually did it to some extent for bands he and, was and, saying and, he, yeah um, and the thought maybe you know what, i might take this seriously actually but it was entirely for banter yeah in the end he only got forty thousand votes yeah and he was saying it this is just for vibes yeah he was saying it so people tried to compare me to him that's not on that's not on isn't it nah. and he is he's a comedian he, that's what they do they do pranks and stuff and they're quite funny so uh yeah that's why i didn't speak to bro if you, if you tell the people of a city or a town that one of your candidates is a TikToker, immediately the, the your instinctive feeling is is this guy a serious person they're a TikToker. why why what how are you gonna take politics seriously so i get that but look kind of just like let's let's kind of put this out bed if we may did you make any attempt at reaching out to the lady in question because then it surfaced that she's someone who has somewhat warm relations with Muslims, has been involved in events 
where it's been pro-Muslim or pro-Palestine. Uh, this, these are the things that were circulating. Yeah, I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how true it is. Messages were doing the rounds, you know, you know, and saying that, look, th this was wrong. Have you tried reaching out to her? Has it passed your mind? Uh, no, he has. Of course he has. Because I, I just feel that with, because you, you came out of the mayoral race on a high, bro. I, I mean, ideally, of course, everyone would have wanted to have those of conscious, those who are truly on the side of the Palestinian people and Muslims would have wanted you, you to have won. But the fact that you came third with 70,000 votes was kind of a win without winning. Yeah. Right? Do you not feel that this incident kind of has pushed you back a little bit now? No, I don't feel that. No? This incident has pushed me back because of the fact that it shows courage that I actually use my platform again, putting myself, my neck on the line again, to publish something that may have been racist. So I don't think it's uh, done any damage to my profile, but it has done damage uh, in terms of uh, me, the mainstream media and the papers that keep saying, this is going to happen to me, that's going to happen to me, trying to force a response out of me. Mm. Other than that, I don't think it's done me any damage. And of course, like I, I feel bad for the teacher and I will reach out to the teacher in uh, my own time. I'm not going to be bullied by the media to do what's right. I know what's right and what's wrong. Mm. And like I said, I am very remorseful because of uh, what the teacher's gone through. And it wasn't only me who shared that video. Uh, of course, it was shared before. That's how it came to me. And I, like I mentioned earlier, I took it off all platforms and I actively DM'd a lot of other pages on Instagram and asked them, requested, because I can't, you know, it's their, it's their page, I can't ask them to do anything. I requested them to remove it, and they did. So uh, the remorse is always there, and I'm not going to sit here and say that I've done something good when I haven't. And uh, but you don't think, but, but you don't see it as something that will impact you come November or when when the general election is announced. No, it should it should it should it should it should it should. It should, it should do, you, do you think Labour might use this against you? Or Labour might? Election? I mean, Labour have been trying all sorts with me. So look, let me tell you something about the mayoral race and what's been happening uh, to me. Because we haven't really spoken about that at all. Because we know that when you run for it, look, my dad ran for independent councillor in my local ward of Queen's Park. He actually lost by one vote after two recounts. Crazy. Wow. He was he was formerly a Labour man, had a fallout with the current MP Mohammed Yassin, Yassin. and um, he lost by one vote. And my dad refused the third recount. He said, "I'm give it to him over a vote." Wow. So so I know that was a local council election, right? And I saw how busy my dad was, and I saw the dirty games. That was being played by the other side, where it was whether it was the leveraging of certain brothers, whether it was planting a last minute dot com candidate for a party that you know is going to split the vote, and when you lose by one vote, a hundred votes is a lot. You understand? So, so you must have experienced similar things, but on a bigger scale, from the op your main opposition that you're running See, against. Uh, but a lot of people, I don't discuss this because I don't like to be, uh, I don't like to victimize myself. But Tommy Robinson, he was on my case and he had a free run against me. Yeah, on X, he said that basically he'll try linking you to groomers. Yeah, to groomers and all sorts, which is completely false. Like I said, I think I made a video about this as well. I said, as a convicted um, fraudster, fraudster or criminal, <laughs> Tommy should know that his lawyers do not partake uh, or share the same views as him and same thing with me i don't partake or share the same views as my clients secondly i don't have a criteria which is required for you to take a picture with me i don't ask for your cv 
if you're going to take a picture with me. I don't think anybody does, to be mm. fair. Anyone can take selfies, especially if you're a public figure. Exactly. Um, that was Tommy's attack on me. Then you have, and we know Tommy's funded by the Zionist, the Zionist, the, above. Zionist lobby. Industry. So, uh, and I'm not shy to say stuff like this. No, no, he's, he's just, this guy's more Israeli than most Israelis, to be honest. Exactly. Uh, then you have the Labour Party itself. They went crazy. Thursday, the election happened. Friday was uh, the verification. Uh, it's not a count, but it's when you verify the ballot papers. Yep. So you get a gist of what's going on. Saturday morning, I woke up to all sorts uh, saying uh, this is the West Midlands, not the Middle East. And today, oh God, yeah, that, that story went viral. Today, Hamas have decided who's going to be the West Midlands Western mayor. GB News were all over it. Yeah. So basically call, calling my voters and supporters Hamas sympathizers. And then you have this councillor, I forgot his name, and even if I knew his name, I wouldn't say it, but I don't want to give him no uh, importance. He said, the mayor of West Midlands is going to call Hamas tomorrow morning. You know, all of this stuff, pre-election, and then a day after the election, I get this video sent to me. Yeah, I must have did it in haste because of all the stuff that I've been going through, now the paper, pa papers don't highlight that kind of stuff. Um, but that's just, uh, we, we know as much that, you know, whether, if you are standing as independent or workers' party, and you're standing against either Labour or Tories on the issue of Gaza, you are not going to be seen or reported favourably by the mainstream media, be it local or national. He, he, you're not, you're, you're not, just not going to get that. You're not going to get that. You get so the opposite. You get the opposite. So I've not received an apology from the Labour Party for saying about all of that stuff about Hamas and stuff. And I don't need one as well. I'm okay. I'll move on. What about locally though? You know, because you, you, because you're having to deal with other Muslims, other Pakistanis, other Kashmiris, other South Asians, people that you know you may know through. Family, culture, community, tribe, wherever you may, you're having to deal with people who are going to vote Labour. What was your interactions with them? Them hardcore Labour Muslim voters? I don't think I had. Uh, Did you bump into it? Did you have any of that role or any dramas? No, no. Okay. Alhamdulillah, you know, because I'm quite popular in Birmingham anyway, and I don't think they would want to go face to face with. I'm not trying to say that I'm, you know, intelligent or more intelligent than them or anything like that but i'm just saying simply they wouldn't want to go face to face with me because of the fact that they probably know me and there's going to be a connection somewhere anyway so they i've not fallen out with any of the labor party members within west midlands because we've not come face to face and they've not really tried anything okay. with me underhand give it to them what was the issue was when I was standing up and doing speeches and talking, convincing people that, look, I've got people like uh, Britain's First after me. I've got people like Tommy Robinson after me. So I need support from my own people now. 100%. So don't go against me, please, just for this time. Show that you're against Britain first. Show that you're against Tommy Robinson. Show that you're against Labour Party. Show that you're against Tory Party. So I didn't get into no altercations, but convincing some people was difficult. But I think I managed to do it. Innit? I've managed. What would your concluding words be to those from your constituency, mainly, but generally those across the country who would be seeing this podcast? What's your parting advice for them in the upcoming general elections? A lot of people who are pro-Palestine, this is a message to you guys specifically. It's all good and well attending protests every weekend, but you're going to have a chance to do something a lot more powerful than any protests or demonstrations that you have been to. 
And that chance is going to come in the general elections. When you take those 10, 20 active steps to go to the polling station and you cast your vote on a pro-Palestinian candidate, on the independent candidate or the Workers' Party candidate, that is going to be a powerful statement and a statement against the political elites of this country that have been ruling us for decades and that have been taking our votes for granted for years. That is going to be more powerful than any protest or demonstration that you have been to. So make sure you cast your vote come general elections. And if you're not registered to vote, a lot of people are not registered to vote. They don't vote. Mm, a lot of people true. don't vote. If you're not registered to vote, then please register to vote. So this general election can be a slap on the faces of the political elites who are ruled by the Zionist lobby. It can be a slap on their faces to show that humanity has not left the people of the UK. Remember that. Ahmed, Zakhla Khair, bro. Yeah. Is, I thoroughly Thank enjoyed today's conversation. It's good having you on, bro. Thank you for having me, man. And, and all the best for the elections, inshallah. May you be successful. Uh, and I look forward to having you on again, perhaps as an MP. Inshallah. Inshallah. The next time we'll be as an MP. The inshallah. next time you come on, you may be our first MP to be seated on the Bro Brothers podcast. Inshallah. inshallah. Make sure to keep it exclusive then, because there will be a few Muslim new MPs. Oh, definitely. But I'll you, be the first no, one. no, you'll be the first one because inshallah. simply because of your journey. Quick, it happened. You said it yourself. It happened in November. Happened randomly. You decided in a in, in a South Hall Masjid. I'm uh, Allah, Allah, man. Allah, man. Allah makes way. Of course. All the best, my brother. Jazakallah, man. Barakallah, fiq. Brothers and sisters and friends, I hope you all thoroughly enjoyed this podcast and this episode as much as I did. If you're tuning in via YouTube, do remember to click subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel. And of course, you can find this episode on all three seasons and all the major audio platforms. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.